Today, I'm with Brian Klatzer, and he is the acclaimed author of bed is Burning and the recently released The Body Politic, which is a phenomenal book, and the forthcoming book, Taking the Stress Out of Homework. Brian is also the co-founder of Teachers Who Tutor. I can't even say it. Teachers Who Tutor, excuse me. And it is the only New York City tutoring company that actually has teachers who all hold master's degrees. And needless to say, he is a wonderful high school and middle school English teacher with an MFA from Johns Hopkins and a BA in English and everything else from Columbia. He's a wildly intelligent human being. So I'm very honored to be asking you three questions today and maybe- a I'm very honored to be answering them. This is exciting. How are teachers and schools handling distance learning right now? And what, what should they be doing? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that those schools with technology who are able to disseminate you know, enough laptops and smart screens or whatever it is, or whose students have access to them, I feel like their number one priority should be creating a sense of normalcy and schedule for these kids to the extent that we can. Um, students in general, all the studies suggest, but especially in times of chaos and uncertainty, need a regular sense of order and what they can look forward to and what they can expect because of so much disorder that's in their life already. So I think the primary goal of schools right now should be to create a context where students have a sense of what is reliable in their life and to be there for the students. That means a schedule that is followed regularly. It means as much face time as possible with teachers with whom they're comfortable. I think the difference between spending 20 minutes talking about a book with a teacher and having the teacher pre-record that conversation is um, massive. Students want to feel like they are being in communication with the adults and you know um, mentors and guideposts that have been there with them before. So teachers' primary job should be creating that sense of order within this chaos and giving students a schedule that they can rely on. And then the secondary job is you know trying to teach a little bit and getting as much of the curriculum in there as feels doable at the moment. But that to me falls a long second away from creating that order, that structure, that community that kids really need right now, whether they're in kindergarten, you know, all the way up through 12th grade. So I think it's interesting that you mentioned the order, chaos, and community, because Brian, something that I didn't mention is that you, while working from home with your wife at home as well, you also are managing a four-year-old and a six-year-old. So you have preschool, elementary, middle, and high school covered within your four walls at the, at the time. And especially now, it's amazing to see the degree to which a four-year-old is similar to a 12th grader in a lot of ways. Just the, the hunger for personal attention and structure and the ability to anticipate you know, some elements of, of their life when everything else is so unusual uh, exists as much in my four-and-a-half-year-old as it does in my 18-year-old students. So that's a great segue to our second question, which is what do you think families should be doing or what mistakes are families making? I think families are doing their best, and for for the most part, um, mistakes aren't being made. I think that where I see consistent areas of potential improvement are parents who are falling on either side of the neuroses spectrum a, a little bit too dramatically. So I, I, by disposition, am a bit of a neurotic and a planner and want things to be organized. Um, and people on my side who are doing you know, even more of that are expecting, I think, too much on the academic side from their kids. They, they feel like this is a time to be taken advantage of. And if we have French class, we need to learn French. And when else will we be able to conjugate the irregular verbs? And, and for students um, who are seeing this period of time is so strange and for whom it's so difficult to get, you know, their, their land legs back after we enter this distance learning. The idea of focusing and creating anxiety around curriculum itself feels like a problem to me. Seeing this period of two or three or God forbid six, eight, 12 months as a lost academic moment doesn't feel like what the focus should be. On the other side, letting everything go to hell is, is equally dangerous, where I think people are seeing the lack of standardized tests, whether that's 
SATs or APs or Common Core or you know fourth grade graduation tests to get into fifth, etc. Because so many of those are being suspended, parents who are working and trying, you know, they're lucky if they're working, but they're working and trying to maintain a normal academic schedule and putting food on the table and cooking and cleaning. A lot of them are just saying to hell with it and letting everything fall apart. And I think, as I mentioned, my answer to the first question that that can lead to additional chaos or a feeling of depression that adds to the anxiety. So it sounds like we should try to find, like you said, order and chaos and find that middle ground. And another question I'd like to ask you then is as a middle and high school English teacher, are there books that kids, adolescents should be reading at this present time um, where they can actually probably find some alone time within their, right. within their uh, single family homes? It's funny that the, those two questions come in, in that order because I feel like there's a the advice I could give for the student who wants order and who wants to feel like this is all manageable. I've, I've had a bunch of students reading Night by Elie Wiesel over the the last few weeks, it's, I mean, just as a book for young adults, it's spectacular because he, you know, when he experienced um, first the, the ghettos in Hungary and then um, surviving Auschwitz, he did it in the age of a lot of these students. So he started at 13 and ended at 18 and seeing somebody manage such an unbearable, chaotic, horrible experience while going through, you know, what it is to be a teenager and deal with your father and deal with that sort of structure. In, in such worse and more extreme moments, it gives a lot of students I've seen the sense that, you know what, this is hard, but this is manageable. So if, if you feel like your kid or you, if you're that kid right now, wants that sense of ownership over the moment, um, Night by Ellie Wiesel is a wonderful place to start. And for the other side, kids who want an escape, students, young adults who want an escape from, from all of this, I would recommend a, a book called Balzac and the Little Chinese Seamstress by Dai Siji, which is a fairy tale essentially that takes place in China under re-education, but it's two boys, um, teenagers also, who go off into the woods to be re-educated and they find love and, and literature and a way that they can escape in their own imagination through new experiences, where again, it has that, that um, context of strife, but within that they disappear into their imagination. So for kids who want more control, I would definitely recommend Night by Elie Wiesel. And for kids who want a little bit more of a flight of fancy, um, Dai Siji's Balzac and the Little Chinese Seamstress. Thank you very much. Do you have Thank time you. for a question? Absolutely. I'll, if it's not this, it's uh, wrangling my kids. So keep them coming. So my last question to you is I'd love to leave uh, speaking with you with a little, a little bit of optimism. Do you see a, a recreated education system or hope or something you've learned that you'd like to share with, with everyone? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that this is an opportunity where we see all of the elements that we're able to do in a smaller or more personal way show us the, the waste and the, um, what, we, what we've seen previously as necessary might not be, whether that's you know, business travel for my wife, for example, who was able to conduct a lot of the meetings at home that she felt compelled to, to travel for. All, a lot of the rigid expectations in school where it's important to get this done by this time or, or show up, you know, that you need to accomplish these goals. I think that a little bit more of a fluidity to life, um, a little bit more prioritization of community and family in the way that we're relying on now. And just a sense that the people who are here for you now are really here for you. And, and the ability to count on those friends you find yourself talking to more regularly or those family members or whoever it is that is guiding you through this moment, knowing that these are the people for the rest of your life who will be looking after you. It's a wonderful just sort of human warmth uh, addition to, to what we're all trying to uh, trying to learn as we move forward. I love that answer, Brian. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Um, and I feel very honored that Brian checks up on me. So thank you very much. I hope this is a life. You gotta look out for the important people out there. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Brian. And we will stay in touch and take care of yourself. Thank you for making the time. Thank you.